Good afternoon, it's Sunday, March 27th. I'm Ari O'Sullivan, and this is IBI News broadcasting from Jerusalem. In our top story, the fatal shooting of a captured Palestinian terrorist who was allegedly disarmed by a soldier last week continues to stir emotions. Speaking at the start of today's cabinet meeting, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterated the morality of the IDF was unquestionable. Netanyahu stressed that soldiers are our children and they are protecting Israel's high morals as they bravely battle bloodthirsty murderers in difficult operational conditions. He expressed confidence that the IDF would take into account the context of the incident when investigating the circumstances. The controversial incident occurred last Thursday when two Palestinians armed with knives attacked soldiers stationed in Hebron, slightly injuring one. The soldiers fired back at the terrorist. Minutes later, another soldier arrived and shot one of the subdued terrorists in the head. The footage of the shooting released by B'Tselem prompted a public debate over the opening of fire regulations and the army's purity of arms. The IDF says that the company commander immediately realized the gravity of the shooting and referred the matter to the military police. The soldier was detained for questioning on possible murder charges. This morning, new details of the army investigation have come to light. Reportedly, the soldier only arrived to the scene six minutes after the incident was over. He allegedly said, a terrorist who stabs our friend must die. The soldier's family accused the Israeli army of abandoning him. Rallies were held in several locations last night in support of the soldier's actions, and the family held a brief press conference in their home in Ramle. With their backs to the camera, they decried the so-called public lynching of their loved one. Education Minister Naftali Bennett was livid the army was considering charging the soldier with murder, saying it was a moral mistake if a soldier in battle faced such charges. On the face of it, it looks very serious incident. And therefore, I want to send a clear message of support to uh, the chief of staff and to the IDF and their decision to investigate uh, this um, uh, uh, case. In a related development, police have begun probing possible incitement against the IDF chief of staff, Gadi Eisenkot, who quickly condemned Thursday's shooting of the subdued terrorist. Posters comparing Eisenkot to the cruel Persian king Ahasuerosh were posted near military headquarters in Tel Aviv. The ads depicting the IDF general as evil were accompanied by slogans in Hebrew reading, Eisenkot resign and take Bibi and Boogie with you, referring to the Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Moshe Yalon. The ads went on to read, Jewish blood must not be forfeited, shame on you, even Ahasuerosh allowed the Jews to defend themselves. Police are investigating who is behind the placards and who hung them up, saying the act could constitute incitement against the IDF chief of staff. Well, joining us now from our Tel Aviv studio to make some sense of this latest affair is Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, the head of the international branch of the IDF spokesman's office. Hi, Peter. First of all, help us understand the chronology of events. The IDF issued a statement shortly after the shooting on Thursday saying that it was probing the incident before B'Tselem released the video, why? What, what triggered this investigation? Hi, Aria. Good evening. Um, so the first of all, uh, what's really important is what indicated and what initiated the, um, uh, the investigation. And it was indeed um, in, in the aftermath of the attack that took, a pla took place at around 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, we had a situation where the commanders realized that something wrong happened on the ground. Um, the commanders on the ground reported it to their battalion commander who then took it up to the brigade commander who then reported it, of course, to the military police. So what we actually see is a clear internal process of the IDF um, that clearly indicates that there was something, some wrongdoing according to the commander's uh, understanding. Uh, that is what initiated the, um, uh, the military police investigation and that for us, it was clear and it, it made it clear for us that we could make a clear-cut mm -hmm. statement that based on the initial in, in after-action review that we'd seen, that there had been a grave breach of IDF values. The Army says this soldier is not going to be subjected to a field trial and that uh, his version would be heard. Yet there already have been leaks from the investigation that, that appear to condemn him, and his, um, his lawyers are, have also come to out in his uh, defense. So now what gives? It's not going to be a field trial, but a lot of information has already been released. So in a circumstance uh, like this where you know, it, it is very irregular to see a, an IDF soldier shoot and kill somebody. So in that type of scenario, we uh, are required to step up to the plate and make a clear statement. You know, our values are the ethical compass of the IDF. Without them, 
you know, the military activities uh, would constantly be judged and we have to continually and, and actually we after every action that we carry out uh, positive or negative we do an after action review in order to learn from the mistakes um, to uh, better ourselves and to improve ourselves for future future activities so in, in the aftermath of this um, our, what we are required to do is actually to look at our moral compass mm -hmm. to look at the values that are required by the military speci specifically purity of arms and to judge ourselves first of all to see if we were living up to that standard and what it appears to be um, in the aftermath of that attack there was a grave breach that initiated the military police investigation and then afterwards several hours afterwards um, the emerging of the video that Betelem took um, made it a clear-cut case from us from a perspective of making a public statement. That does not negate in any way or form the official military police investigation that has to take place and determine beyond the after-action review that uh, suggests that there was a breach. You know, the public is watching how the army behaves here, but what, what about the soldiers? What message are they going to get from how the army is behaving? So we have a clear message to the soldiers. There is a clear chain of command. Uh, and you have to do, and, and, and the chief of staff said it two months ago, that there is a limit of the amount of force that we have to use, and we have to use only the amount of force mm -hmm. in order to negate the threat. Um, and we have to set that standard high. That is our uh, obligation. You know, Voltaire said, uh, with great uh, power comes great responsibility. And when you give and arm a young man, they have a huge amount of responsibility of knowing when it is p permissible to use that and when is not. And I think this is the, the, the biggest question that we have to ask. Well, what's the risk now that leading troops to maybe think twice before they take critical action? No, that is not uh, what we're saying in any way or form. And I, I would say quite the contrary. We are, ha and we have to empower the, fo the soldiers on the ground, empower the forces, give them um, uh, self-confidence, give them the tools and give them the ability to judge when it's right or not right. Um, you know, as you pointed out in the opening of, of the broadcast, uh, six minutes before, before this uh, soldier arrived, the event had already been over. Mm -hmm. The situation was r relatively stable on the ground. The commanders were in control. And the question is, was there any real necessity to carry out this shoot? You're, uh, you're this IDF spokesman. What do you say to the family of the soldier that claims that the media and the establishment are publicly lynching him? We have a responsibility to be transparent to all of society. If we see a wrongdoing, we are upfront. We say that there has been a wrongdoing. And it can happen in a severe case like this. And it can happen, um, you know, the IDF spokesperson is accountable every single day mm -hmm. to hundreds of questions by journalists about how we conduct ourselves. Are we living up to the standards? Are we delivering the goods that Israeli society respect, re expects from us? So I would say this is a, an extreme case. Mm -hmm. It de definitely requires extreme measures. And that is why we have to send a clear message to the families. Yes, we have your back. Um, but, that we, but there are values that we cannot cross. And if we cross them, then we need to go with due process. Peter, how damaging is this incident to the image of the IDF? Well, naturally, I think there are several components that uh, merge together um, as far as the image of the IDF is concerned, definitely on an international perspective. Um, you know, the, the reality is the IDF dealt with this incident in a real-time basis not giving any um, of our uh, uh, perhaps adversaries any steam in order to uh, blame Israel mm -hmm. uh, for not taking measures. So I would say there, are, on one hand, there is, of course, uh, a damage when uh, these types of images that do not seem uh, from the outset, do not seem to be warranted. Um, there is damage, but it has to be damage control. And as a spokesperson uh, for the military, my job is constantly dealing with crisis communications and, and conveying messages in times of crisis. So I would say uh, damage control, absolutely, and you know, the need to send a clear message that the Israel Defense Forces has clear values, clear standards, and what we expect from our soldiers is very clear. And I think it also gives us some level of credibility in future cases when that conduct comes into question. Um, so we have to be, when we are clear and, and, and upfront and, and transparent about things, that absolutely gives us some credibility. Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, thanks so much for joining IBA News. Good evening. Good evening.
Thousands arrived this afternoon to take part in the funeral of Brigadier General Munir Amar, the recently appointed Druze head of the civil administration in Judea and Samaria, who was killed Friday when the light plane he was piloting crashed in the northern Gush Segev region. Amar was laid to rest this afternoon in his home village of Julis. The 47-year-old general previously served as deputy commander of the Samaria Brigade, the Hermon Brigade, and headed the Haifa District Home Front Command. IDF Chief of Staff Gen uh, Gadi Eisenkot expressed his deep sorrow over Amar's death, describing him as an exceptional officer who served in a number of senior army positions with great success. Defense Minister Moshe Alon called the death of the Druze officer a tremendous loss for the IDF. Former President Katsav and convicted rapist Moshe Katsav today appeared before the prison parole board to discuss his plea for early release from the Masayao prison in Ramle, where he has already served four years. The committee, headed by a retired judge, held a closed-door session to hear the arguments by Katsav and his attorneys, who are requesting that his prison term be cut by one-third. The state prosecutor, who is opposed to the early release, was also in attendance. Katsav was sentenced to seven years in prison after being convicted on several accounts of rape and other sexual offenses. Women's groups across the country are lobbying against the move, and a final ruling on the matter is set for a later date. For more on this issue, I'm joined now by attorney Michael Partham of the Movement for Equality Government. Michael, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Michael, the, the board sat today to hear Katsav's argument. Does the former president stand a chance now to get early release? Well, the major factor behind early release is good behavior. Uh, after that, they take into account whether or not we... Just a minute. We have a little bit of a technical problem. Is it okay now? We're fixing your sound. Your mic is not open. It's okay. So we, what we're going to be asking you is whether or not... Uh, okay, we're fixed. So, okay. so we're, we're fixed. go from the beginning. Oh, okay. Does he have a chance? As a well, he, he has a chance in that the, uh, uh, the parole committee takes into account good behavior, obviously, and whether or not he poses a risk to society. Okay. Uh, so these um, are not necessarily connected with whether or not he has uh, expressed remorse and has undergone rehabilitation within the prison. We know that he has not uh, expressed guilt or contrition, and he still feels or con uh, maintains that he was, uh, uh, didn't commit any severe crimes. However, that being said, uh, there is a court precedent in a very similar circumstances, a very high a military official uh, was convicted of sexual offenses while um, in command, mm -hmm. and he was serving six years in jail. The, par, the committee decided to take off a third, and there was a challenge to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that the fact that a sexual offender had not admitted to guilt and was being let free into society, mm -hmm. not having understood the severity of his crimes, is a factor that should be taken into account, and it overruled the uh, commission's ruling. Now, you as a lawyer, do you as a lawyer, do you think that's going to have an impact on this? Well, if you have committed a series of any offense, but especially a sexual offense, mm -hmm. and the person being, is being released back into society uh, doesn't admit that he did anything wrong, that constitutes a, a potential danger for society. Of course, every uh, case is different and you have to take the circumstances of every case, but I can imagine a situation where the uh, commission decides to take off a third and that is challenged in the court. So I think that while the commission can stress other factors and perhaps overlook or discount the fact that the uh, former president has uh, not admitted guilt or contrition in this case, uh, I, that, that could very well be challenged. And I just, I just want to mm -hmm. add one thing. You know, in the movement for quality government, we deal with quality government and government issues. The abuse of public authority to commit sexual offenses is corruption. These are very severe crimes he's been convicted of. And it's certainly, um, leniency certainly doesn't send the message that we would want sent to other public officials who are in similar situations. It, unfortunately, there have been too many cases of this kind of abuse of public authority, and therefore, on those grounds, certainly we would be against a over-leniency in this case. 
That being said, the Commission can take into a variety of factors. We're not privy to all the factors, and we have to see what they say. Well, on that note, suppose they do de deny his request. What are the chances of him getting an, uh, a pardon from the President? A pardon is more problematic uh, than uh, getting off time for good behavior, mm -hmm. because getting off time for good behavior, they can always say, you know, he behaved very nicely in prison. He was... Uh, uh, very obedient and he caused no problems. He was a model prisoner and he had some some sort of uh, uh, rehabilitation so uh, therefore we decided to reduce the sentence by a third. Pardon however uh, means that uh, you know we are pardoning him. The connotation of the word pardon means somehow that his guilt is being um, discounted or, 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 or lessened or expunged. So we actually had a petition which was signed by thousands of people online against such a pardon. So I, I would say that uh, it's easier to swallow, so to speak, from a mm -hmm. public point of view, uh, reduction in sentence than it is a pardon, which would uh, send a very bad message that uh, a former politician being part, a former president being mm -hmm. pardoned by a current president uh, for crimes which we consider to be a very serious mm -hmm. abuse of power. Unfortunately, Michael Partum, that's all the time we have, but thanks so much for joining IBA News. You're welcome. Turkish authorities have issued a warning against terror attacks targeting Christians and Jews in the country in the coming days. The advisory warning comes amid intelligence information that Islamic State may attack churches as well as synagogues on Easter Sunday. Turkey raised its security level following last Saturday's suicide bombing in Istanbul in which three Israelis and an Iranian were killed. Turkish police have warned that Islamic State terror members may have scouted out places of worship as well as consulates and embassies, stressing that churches and synagogues, specifically in Ankara, as well as places belonging to non-Muslims, should be on higher alert this weekend. Turning to last week's bombing in Brussels, and the Belgian authorities have arrested the third terrorist claimed to be the man in the hat who was filmed on surveillance video at the Brussels airport minutes before Tuesday's attacks. The man was identified as Faisal Chefouf, a Belgian freelance journalist and filmmaker. He is charged with involvement in a terrorist group, murder, and attempted terrorist murder. Chefou was fingered by a taxi driver who drove the three terrorists to the airport. The two other men, known as El Barakai brothers, blew themselves up at the Brussels airport and metro station, killing 34 people. Today is Easter Sunday, and Western Christians around the world are observing the resurrection of Jesus Christ in two, Jerusalem 2,000 years ago after his crucifixion and burial. Marking the event, Christian pilgrims of the Catholic and Protestant denominations flock to the Old City to walk the Via Dolorosa and worship in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, although the numbers are fewer than in years past. In Rome, the Pope Francis delivered an Easter message of hope following a grim week of terror in Europe. Speaking under tight security, the Pope said, let us not allow fear and darkness to distract us and control our hearts. Eastern Orthodox Christians celebrate Easter on May 1st. And despite everything that's going on, there is always room for some encouraging news. Here's a list of five good things that may cheer you up or may make you feel a little proud. You can breathe a sigh of relief. The U.S. FDA approves Teva's treatment for asthma. The Israeli ph pharmaceutical giant can sell its medicine, Sinkair, which will compete with the current wave of biotech drugs for severe asthma already available on the American market. The first sustainable farming initiative leveraging Israel's unparalleled research and innovation in water technology to reduce water for rice crop will kick off in Woodland, California. BBC adaptation of award-winning Israeli drama Yellow Peppers debuts across Europe, garnering high ratings. The A word, which focuses on young child with autism, is the first time the BBC, which is synonymous with quality television, is remaking an Israeli drama series. Israeli couple wins second place in a global cycling competition. Despite suffering from dehydration, Edith Shub and Gal Tzchor reached the coveted second spot for the second time in a row in the international Mike mountain biking competition in South Africa. And Israeli Wonder Woman Gal Gadot is taking the world by storm with the premiere of Batman vs. Superman at movie theaters worldwide. In local finance, with no currency trading on Sundays, the shekel remains the same, while share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange were down across the board. Here's a look at the mid-afternoon numbers.
Looking at the weather now, and the forecast is for rain and winds in the north and center parts of the country and scattered showers in the south. Temperatures will drop somewhat, and there are flood warnings for the eastern rivers. Here's a look at the expected highs and lows at home and abroad for the next 24 hours. That's our broadcast of IBA News for today. Please join us again tomorrow when I'll be back here to bring you the latest breaking news from Israel. I'm Ariel Sullivan wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.